presence of everyone here this morning. I encourage you to be taking out your Bibles and following along with me. And you may want to put a marker there in 1 Corinthians 5 if you haven't already. We'll be going back to that passage on uh, multiple occasions here uh, this, uh, this morning. This afternoon, if you have time, I'd encourage you to read through the book of 2 Timothy. It's not a, a, an overly long book, just four chapters long. But what we want to talk about this evening is overcoming difficult times from 2 Timothy. And we'll talk some about that, uh, the background, but Paul was facing a difficult situation uh, with the end of his life nearing. Timothy was facing a difficult situation. Many Christians were. And Paul gives some things there in that book that will help us in overcoming difficult times. But this morning, we want to continue our series of lessons that we've been in on issues facing the church. We began several weeks ago with an introduction where we talked about the fact that the church has always faced issues. They faced them in the first century. Now, the passage that was read for us a moment ago was one of the ones we referenced of an issue in the first century church where discipline was not being practiced. We talked about why we need this study. We don't want to be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We want to be ready to give a defense when somebody asks us for the reason for the hope that is in us. And we don't want to repeat history because those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And then we talked about some of the issues facing the church. Issues like a lack of sound preaching, a lack of teaching on and respect for Bible authority, a lack of church discipline, error on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, questions about church-sponsored social meals, questions on the church accepting homosexuality, error on social drinking, those teaching, the, that should be on the next line, those teaching gospel doctrine distinction, the fellowshipping of false teachers, realized eschatology, or better known as AD 70 doctrine, and neo-Calvinism are just some of the issues the church is facing or likely will face in the time ahead. And so we've been working through that list. We may at some point get them out of order from what they are on the list, but we've been going so far in order. We talked a couple of weeks ago about a lack of sound preaching. We talked about what the problem is. Sometimes we don't understand what sound means. We think it just simply means they don't teach error, but there's more involved than just not teaching error. There's involved in that than teaching everything necessary for our spiritual health. We talked about the need, and that is the need is for sound preaching, and we looked at what sound preaching is as described in the Scriptures. We talked about the results of sound preaching. When we have the kind of preaching and teaching that we need, what results is others being encouraged, others being able to fulfill their role, and being able to stand firm against uh, error. And then we talked about the consequences of a lack of sound preaching. We're not going to be able to give that defense, and some sin goes undealt with. Last week, we talked about a lack of teaching on and respect for Bible authority. We talked about the problem, it being a first, a, a first principle or basic principle. Sometimes we think, well, everybody knows it, we don't need to deal with it, and it gets neglected. The consequences of not teaching on it is, when we don't deal with it, then issues are going to arise concerning it. They have in the past, they will if we don't deal with it, and do some preventative teaching. And then the solution was to teach on and respect Bible authority. How to establish it. The difference in generic versus specific authority. The difference in an aid versus an addition. And about the silence of the Scriptures. This week, we want to continue that study by talking about a lack of church discipline. That's an issue facing the church. As we did with our last couple of lessons, let's begin with the problem. The problem is discipline is not always practiced in every place. Like at Corinth, there are churches today that are not practicing discipline. The issue at Corinth was one where you've got somebody among them that was not even accepted in society that a man has his father's wife. And so what's taking place here at Corinth, excuse me, <clears throat> What's taking place at Corinth is we've got the discipline not being practiced, and the same thing happens today. Perhaps you've heard of it. There are churches who may not have, who may have uh, been years or even decades for some of them since they've practiced church discipline, and then perhaps they stand back and think, "I wonder what the problem is. Why are we having so many issues? Because discipline has not been practiced." 
The problem is discipline is not always practiced in every place as it needs to be. There are those churches today that are more like Corinth before 1 Corinthians when it comes to discipline than after Paul writes. Because to their credit, they did what they were supposed to do. The problem is not always that it's not just not practiced. Sometimes inconsistent discipline is practiced. There are some churches who may occasionally practice discipline. They may withdraw from some who walk disorderly, but not everyone. We'll deal with this case, but we ignore this case over here. We'll deal with this case, but we're going to ignore this case over here. Some churches are inconsistent. And aside from the fact that that's just wrong because we need to withdraw from everyone that's disorderly when they won't change, it can cause frustration on the part of some. Why did they withdraw from and insert whoever? And why not deal with this other case? Particularly may be frustrating to the family who's get, who, who was the one whose uh, loved one was disciplined. And rightfully so, but if they were dealt with, but somebody else doing the same thing or something very similar is not dealt with, frustrations may arise. And others will not be learning from it. You see, the problem is discipline is not always practiced in every place. And in some places it's practiced, but on a very inconsistent basis. Let's talk about the consequences. That is, the consequences of not deal, uh, practicing church discipline. Well, number one, a little leaven leavens the whole lot. Go again to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I said we'd be spending a great deal of time here. We'll go to a couple of other passages in our final point, uh, where we'll spend most of our time. But uh, 1 Corinthians 5, it's one of those chapters that along with Matthew 18 and 2 Thessalonians 3, where we learn the most about church discipline. And what Paul warned them of in verse 6 was this. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. We could put it this way. A little bit of sin can cause bigger problems. When you allow a, a situation where there is sin that goes undealt with to just sit there and sort of fester and time goes on, you may think there's one issue not being dealt with, but in reality, there are more beginning to brew under the surface. Others may follow the example of the one in sin because after all, there doesn't seem to be any consequences. I've said this before, I'll say it again. You will not find a church that is overrun with sin, that is a church that once practiced the truth, that is overrun with sin, that it didn't begin with a lack of discipline. Maybe it was a false teacher that wasn't dealt with or marked properly. Maybe it was somebody in sin that wasn't marked with and then others followed that example and they couldn't practice it. But if you find a church that has a lot of people not dealt with, it all began with a one case. Maybe it was a family. Maybe, again, an individual false teaching false doctrine. But whatever it is, if you've got a church that has a lot of issues arising, then what's taken, because of sin, it begins when discipline wasn't practiced in the first place. If you practice discipline, it can cause others to fear. But when discipline is not practiced, it allows others to follow the example. I've used this illustration before, but just imagine trying to be a parent raising a teenager in the city of Corinth. Imagine parenting at Corinth with the fornication that's taking place with his brother. And then a teenager commits the sin of fornication and the parents try to talk to him. Maybe the elders try to talk to him. Here's somebody that's obeyed the gospel. They've gone off. They've done something wrong. They're guilty of fornication and their parents try to talk to them or the preacher or the elders and they're trying to talk to them and tell them, you can't do that. And you can imagine a response something like this. Or perhaps they're not, it's not known, but this is their justification in their mind. What is the problem? Brother so-and-so has his father's wife and he's taking a leading role at church. How are you going to teach that child? When you've got a congregation that's accepting a man that the world won't even accept because of the sin that he's involved in. And they're trying to raise their children. 
and tell them well, you can't do you can't commit the sin of fornication. Why not? He's doing it week in and week out, and we're accepting him and he's leading in service. You see what happens is if a little leaven leavens the whole lump, one sin may go undealt with, but more and more and more will begin to result a- until there are widespread problems. But the other consequence is it does not save the lost person. Church discipline is not just about keeping the church pure. That is a part of it. That is a large part of it. The reason there are a lot of issues with churches today that haven't practiced discipline is because it hasn't been kept pure. But that's not the only reason discipline is practiced. Discipline is practiced to save the one who's in sin. Look again, 1 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Discipline needs to be practiced so that the one who's in sin can be saved. And let me tell you, when practiced, it works. When church discipline is practiced, there should have been another point there. When properly practiced, it works. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you'll go to 2 Corinthians 2 with me. Again, I apparently didn't have it on the board, but 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those for whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. The punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Sometimes what's talked about today is, well, that doesn't work for my family, that doesn't work for my friend. When church discipline's done right, it works. The Scriptures show us that it works. Let's spend the rest of our time this morning talking about the solution, and the solution is to understand church discipline. Now, obviously, it's not just understand it, we've got to carry it out. But before we can carry it out, we've got to understand what it is we are carrying out. And so we've got to understand church discipline. That means first and foremost, we've got to understand what it is. Before we talk about the specifics of church discipline, we've got to understand just the basics of what it is. It involves, first and foremost, a public marking that should be. Not marketing, marking. A public marking of one. That's what takes place in 1 Corinthians 5. When you're gathered to gather, deliver such a one to Satan. So what's taking place is a public marking of the one who is in sin. And we've done had to do that here. When somebody's walking disorderly and one of the elders gets up and says, we are withdrawing from so-and-so. That's the public marking taking place. But it's not just a public marking. I think that's the idea that we have, that we list it and we say, here's what needs to be done. We're going to mark and we're withdrawing from somebody. And the idea that I think is had in the minds of many is we take them off the directory list, and that's the end result of it. But it involves more than just a public marking. It involves withdrawal on an individual basis. Sometimes the terminology that's used, especially when there have been lawsuits against churches for, for practicing discipline, is that somebody was kicked out of church. That's not true. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I wish every time we withdrew from somebody, I'd see them sitting in the pew the next service. That would be nice if we had to deal with somebody, but they were still here at services because that's where they need to be and what they need to be hearing. But in the vast majority of cases, I have seen a few exceptions where maybe somebody was caught in a sin like adultery and then they were withdrawn from because they wouldn't repent of it, but they were still coming to services. But in the vast majority of cases, when some when disciplines practice, they're already not coming. That's most cases. 
Maybe they were drawn from because they quit coming, maybe because of some other sin, and then they quit coming. But in most cases, they're already not coming. We're not telling them not to come to church. We wish they would. We're not saying, we're not just taking them off a directory. We're doing a public marking, and then as individuals, we carry through with the withdrawal. Go to 2 Thessalonians 3. Still, we go to a couple of other passages. We'll come back to 1 Corinthians later on, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Should not be unfamiliar to us. It was, I think, a couple of weeks ago or so, a week or two ago. This was part of our Bible reading. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and in verse 6 it says, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. The ESV would render that, keep away from every brother. The American Standard Version and King James Version would translate that, withdraw yourselves. There is a public marking that takes place, but then on an individual basis, we withdraw from the individual. That is, we no longer treat them the same way we did before in terms of our relationship. We'll talk in a minute. We're going to try to restore them. We're going to still be trying to get them to come back. But sometimes what happens is a public marking, and then a private, privately there's no withdrawal taking place. And so the church faces issues because it's not practiced, but that's because we don't understand what it is. Not only does 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 tell us that, uh, verse 11, look at verse 11, same text. For we hear that there are some among you who are, uh, who, who are disorderly men, or not, walking, uh, not working at all, but are busybodies. Uh, that's the wrong verse. Uh, but he says somewhere uh, back here in the text not to uh, have nothing to do with. And, and 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, not to keep company with. 1 Corinthians 5, 11, not even to eat with such a one. As Paul's warning them there at Corinth about the issue that they're facing, the, the uh, discipline that they need to be practicing, and all of these problems that have uh, come about, he, he's telling them here uh, at Corinth, you, you can't keep going on like nothing's wrong. And that doesn't mean that you just sit there as he comes to services. Listen, again, if they withdraw from him and he comes to church, great. That's where he needs to be, to be hearing the truth. But you don't treat him the same in your relationships. You do not keep company with, as we said, verse 9, sexually immoral people. Not just the sexually immoral, he would list others in verse 11. Uh, covetousness, idolaters, revel, uh, revilers, drunkards, and extortioners. You don't keep company with those. Not those of the world. You'd have to be out of the world and not be around those of the world that are doing those kinds of things. But, if, but look at verse 11. But now I've written with you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who does those things. Now look at the end of verse 11. Not even to eat with such a person. Again, I've said this before. We get to that portion. We get to, to, to that part of the uh, to that part of the text. And, and, and oftentimes what ends up happening is in the minds of many, it is not to eat with. Just don't eat with. Maybe some people will gather together and they'll go to the ball game together and they'll go to the movies together and they'll go shopping together and they'll go do everything together. And then when the end, when it comes down and they go, let's be ready to eat. Oh, no, 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 I can't do that. You know what the scripture, you're not living right. You know what the scriptures say. Don't even, or not to eat with such a one. It's not even to eat. That is of the least of the things you could do would be to eat. And so what he's saying is you do not on an individual basis keep company with. Verse 13, same text, put away from yourselves. But those who are outside of God, uh, but those who are outside God judges, therefore put away every, uh, put away from yourselves the evil person. Verse 13. Matthew 18, 17, they should be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. All we're trying to do is understand what church discipline is. And in order to understand, and to make sure that we properly carry it out, and we began by understanding, well, we, to understand this, we have to understand what it is. It's a public marking, but a private withdrawal. It doesn't just mean when the elders read a letter that says we're withdrawing from somebody that that's the end. We as individuals then have to withdraw ourselves. But the part of the problem is not just that we don't understand what it is, we don't understand its purpose. And again, we dealt with some of this a moment ago, but it is to save the one that is wayward. Again, verse 5, that his spirit may be saved. 
2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, that he may be ashamed. Again, what we're trying to do is not just keep the church pure. We're trying to save the person in sin. That's why sometimes people will say, I, I know what the scriptures say, but for my family, my friend, this is what, that's just not what's going to work. That's what God said would save them. And it did. I don't, and there's some debate. We talked about this when we were in 2 Corinthians. There's some debate as to who the person of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 is. Is it the people that are in opposition to Paul uh, who are calling into question his apostleship? Was it representation not necessarily of an individual but more of the church? I think the only one that really fits the text is that it is the fornicator. Because the sin Paul says was not against him. The ones in opposition to him were sinning against Paul. But he said that wasn't the case in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And it's an individual, and an individual sin. And the only person I see that fits 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 through 8, is the fornicator of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul said, if you withdraw from him, it will be for the destruction of the flesh, that you may save his soul. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he's come back, and what Paul says that the punishment inflicted by the majority uh, is sufficient, so forgive him. And the point we have to understand is discipline works when carried out properly. And so when we come to understand discipline, we've got to understand that discipline is to save the one that's lost. Again, when the lawsuits have taken place and a number of them have taken place through the years where a church would practice discipline and then whoever was withdrawn from would, would sue the congregation. And that's a whole other issue from the next chapter in 1 Corinthians. But even aside from that, uh, that one is withdrawn from, and uh, part of the things it said is you kicked the part, they were kicked out of the church. And, and by the way, oftentimes they win the lawsuits uh, against the churches. And, 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 and sometimes there are those within the body of Christ who are going, why are we kicking people out? Or why are we telling people not to? That's not what we're doing. We're trying to save their soul. I heard a preacher several years ago who had a brother who was unfaithful. And his brother was killed in a, I believe it was a plane crash or something along those lines, but his brother was killed. And at the funeral, him and his, his other brother and his sister and I believe that's right. And his parents, they were all standing there. And they, one of them overheard somebody say, I bet they regret them not distancing themselves from him now. I bet they regret what they did. And he said, he said, uh, I, was, I was sitting there listening to him preach on discipline. He said, we were talking about it later, the family was, and we all agreed we wouldn't go back and change a thing. Because we did what we had to do in order for him to be saved. It wasn't done out of hate. As some viewed it, it was done out of love to save him. And unfortunately, in his case, he passed away before it could, but that's the purpose it served. But that's not the only purpose. It is to keep the church pure. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Again, that little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you want to keep the church pure, you've got to keep the leaven out. You've got to keep the sin out. And, and, and here you've got a church at Corinth that, by the way... It, if only the fornicator was the only problem they had. But as we saw when we were studying 1 Corinthians, it's just problem after problem after problem, and discipline is not practiced. And listen, if you're not withdrawing from the fornicator to keep the church pure, you can't withdraw from the brother over here teaching against the, res uh, against the resurrection. I mean, he may be teaching against resurrection, but this guy has his father's wife, and society's not taking him. And so what happens is you've got a church that's accepting and tolerating sin. They're no longer pure. But then discipline is practiced. In 2 Corinthians, Paul has to do some rebuking of those in opposition to him. But you know, 2 Corinthians is not quite as harsh a tone as 1 Corinthians because they've taken care of the problem. They practiced discipline as they needed to. They dealt with those issues to keep the church pure. And when somebody is living in sin, and somebody 
is not living like they need to. The withdrawing from them is not just for their sake. It's, to keep, it's for the sake of keeping the church pure and keeping the sin out. Let me tell you, there's a third purpose in church discipline. And that is it causes others to fear. Go to Acts 5 with me. Acts chapter 5. This isn't church discipline in the sense of withdrawing from somebody. This is discipline in the fact that the Lord struck them dead. In the, in the case of uh, Ananias and Sapphira because of their sin. But I want you to notice what happened. Let's, let's go back to verse 5 first. We have verse 11 on the board and we'll get there, but let's go to verse 5 first. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And then, of course, Sapphira comes and she doesn't know the whole story. And, and Peter asked her, did you sell the land for so much? She says, yes, we sold it for so much. He asked why they lied. He said that those that carried out her husband were waiting at the door to carry her out. She struck dead. They take her. They bury her. Verse 10. Now verse 11. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Go to 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 20. He's dealing with elders in this case, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and uh, Timothy's relationship to elders, but the principle is true beyond just with elders. Uh, verse 20, Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. When church discipline is practiced and carried out on somebody in sin, not only does the one in sin possibly become... Uh, come back and make things right and save the, the one that's wayward, there may be others who maybe they're sort of teetering on the edge. Or maybe they're already in sin, but it's not known yet. I, or, and here they're sitting, and this one is withdrawn from, and now they fear the consequences of their sin. Now they ought to be fearing the eternal consequences as well. But perhaps they fear because of, what is the, because of the rebuke and the withdrawal that's carried out. And not only may it save the one in sin, it may save the other one teetering on the edge and keep them from going off or bring them back if they're already beginning to wander off into sin. The point is, discipline works. Well, how do we... We, we want to make sure that we're not having the issue of a lack of discipline. Many churches are. There are many churches that have that issue. Maybe they don't practice discipline at all, or maybe they do, but on an inconsistent basis. And the consequence of that is you've got sin, you've got a little leaven leavening the whole lump, and you've got those in sin that may not be saved because they're not dealt with properly. What's the solution? We need to understand church discipline. Because until we understand it, we can't carry it out properly. We need to understand what it is. It's a public marking, but individually we withdraw. We need to understand its purpose. It's to save the one in sin. It's to keep the church pure. It's to cause others to fear. Finally, we need to understand how to discipline. We can say, okay, well, I understand what discipline is. I understand its purpose. But how do we carry that out? Well, let me say first and foremost, it's done only after the effort is made to restore them. In Matthew chapter 18 and in verse 15, it's talking about a sin against an individual. That is, if a brother sins against you, here's the process to be carried out. But what I want us to understand from Matthew 18 is, he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Then if that doesn't work, take others with you. And then try to restore him. And then if that doesn't work, tell the whole church. And then if that doesn't work, then you, you, he shall be to you as a tax collector and even. But the point to understand is, that discipline, when they go to the church, is only takes place after the effort to restore. Go to Galatians 6. Sometimes it said, well, Matthew 18, we can't deal with the sin publicly or because they've not been dealt, have they been dealt with privately. Sometimes the sin is public. Maybe it's found out that somebody's having an affair and everybody knows about it. That's not a sin in a private nature. They need to be approached, but that's a public sin. We're not talking about an individual sin. But in that case... Matthew 18 doesn't, this, all the specifics in Matthew 18 does not apply, but Galatians 6 does. 
Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Find out that brother's in sin. We've heard that he's in sin. And we go and we try to restore him. Others try to restore him. The congregation tries to restore him and pray for him. So how do we, what do we need to understand? We need to understand how to discipline. That's done only after an effort's made to restore. Number two, we need to understand how to discipline, and that means we're consistent and impartial in our discipline. This goes back to the second problem that's had, and that is sometimes there's inconsistency in discipline. And we've got to be consistent and impartial. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 says, You withdraw from every brother. There are cases where a church will practice discipline. There's a large number of family in the congregation, maybe, and so they'll practice discipline to other people, but not family, even though they may be doing things from the human standpoint far worse than the other. I don't want to deal with that. Well, we've got to be consistent and impartial. Or maybe we're friends with somebody. I don't want to deal with them because they're my friend. We've got to be consistent and we've got to be impartial in our carrying out of discipline. Let me say we need to be complete. And that is, if discipline... Is not if we're not complete in our discipline, it's not as effective. Sometimes people say, well, listen, I have seen many times the church discipline is carried out and it just does not work. I think there are a number of reasons discipline may not work. First of all, that one will be restored, that's generally true. That's not always true when it's carried out properly. That'll happen in some cases, but it's not an absolute that every time they're going to come back. But I think there are two reasons as to why discipline, two main reasons as to why discipline is not always effective. One, there may not be anything to miss in the first place. And that is, if all we do is shake hands when we come into services and say hi, and then when we leave we say bye, and that's the extent of our relationship, by the time we often withdraw, as we said earlier, people are already not coming most of the time. And so they're, 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 they're not really, they don't really seem to be missing the handshake when they're coming in and leaving. But if we don't have any kind of relationship with them, there's nothing to miss. That's part of the problem. But the second problem is this problem, which is we're not always complete. And that is, when there are relationships, sometimes the thought is, well, I can be more effective if I don't cut off that relationship. And so some withdraw themselves, but others do not. We're not complete in discipline. In order for, to, for, the, for us to be complete in discipline, it requires all of us individually doing our part for discipline to be complete. Number four, we need to act swiftly. Hebrews 3 and in verse 13. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We've got to take the time to make an effort to restore and reach out and try to bring them back and talk to them. But when clearly those efforts are not going anywhere, we've got to act swiftly. If we don't act swiftly and we begin to, to, to drag our feet and, and to wait and, uh, on practicing of discipline, then discipline's not as effective. If we don't carry discipline out uh, promptly, just like in disciplining a child, it needs to be done promptly. If we wait and we don't act swiftly in our, in our efforts, their hearts may become hardened to where they're less likely to be receptive to the discipline that is practiced. Finally, we need to continue to admonish. Yet do not count in verse 15 of 2 Thessalonians uh, uh, 3, verse 15 that should be. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Sometimes in discipline, the opposite of not being completely taken out. And that is, sometimes discipline may not be carried out completely, but at other times, discipline's carried out, and then we treat them like they've got the bubonic plague. And so we've got a distance. Every time we see them in a store or something, it's run the other way. That's not effective either. We've got to continue to admonish them, to encourage them, maybe write them a card or a letter about how we miss them and wish they would come back and make things right. But in order for us to, so what do we need to do to practice discipline properly? We need to understand it, understand what it is, understand its purpose, and understand how to discipline. And then, once we understand it, let me say this, we've got to follow through and care. Knowing's one thing, but then we carry it out. And when we do that, we don't have to worry about a lack of church 
campus. Lord willing, we'll continue our series of studies next week, and then I think the week after that, I, I believe that's the Sunday before our singing, we'll probably take a break that week and then come back to it uh, the next week. As we come to a close this morning, it may be that there's one or more present who may have never responded in obedience to the gospel. If you're here and you've heard the word of God and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, do not repent of your sins, confess your faith, be buried in the waters of baptism, rising to walk in the newness of life, having your sins forgiven, having the hope of heaven when life on earth is over. Maybe you're here and you've done that, but somewhere along the line you say, I've not been as faithful as I need to be. If it's a sin of a private nature, take it to the Lord. you can take it to the Lord privately in prayer. But if it's a sin of a public nature, or, or you desire the prayers of the congregation, we'll gladly pray with you and for you for God to forgive. No matter what your need is, if we could assist you this morning in any way, would you not come forward right now as together we stand and as we sing. Every day.